Great. Um, thanks everyone for joining today's session about citizen science data and information quality. Um, this is Ya Xingwei. I'm from Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, actually, just a few days ago, I took over the chair role uh, from Rama, who was the uh, previous chair of the cluster. And also this year, we have a new co-chair, Bob Downs, actually just stepped in um, from Columbia University. And Rama, um, David Moroni, and uh, Ge Peng will continue to help our cluster uh, as co-chair, co-chairs this year. So uh, at the beginning of the session, I want to point you to the um, agenda, a web page for our session, where you can find a Google Doc link, um, which will contain our meeting notes. And feel free to add your name and contact information into the Google Doc. Um, so first, let me give a very brief introduction to the EC Information Quality Cluster, the IQC. The cluster's vision uh, is to become internationally recognized as an authoritative and responsive information resource for guiding the implementation of data quality standards um, and the best practices of science data systems, data sets, and data and metadata dissemination services. So IQC focuses on four aspects of information quality, uh, science, product, stewardship, and service. Uh, we encourage sharing experiences and we collaborate internationally and we invite uh, speakers to our monthly telecons. And we also organize sessions and presentations at meetings like AGU, AMS, ECP, and OGC meetings. We also have our wiki uh, website available from the ECPfederation.org. Uh, um, ECP IQC had a number of outcomes uh, in the past, uh, including the publications on scientific stewardship in the open data and data big data era, as well as the ensuring and improving information quality for earth science data and products. And more recently, the white paper led by David Moroni, the co-chair of the cluster, um, on the topic of understanding the various perspectives of earth science observation data uncertainty. And David organized the session yesterday, seeking feedbacks and also um, uh, identifying potential improvements that we can make into this uncertainty white paper. I also want to point you to a number of publications that the NASA um, Earth Science Data System Data Quality Working Group uh, made uh, last year. The NASA ESDSWG working, Data Quality Working Group had a very close connection with ECIP IQC. And the Data Quality Working Group published five technical notes uh, through NASA ESDIS Standards Office last year covering the topics of um, recommendations for the data management plan for DAX, uh, the NASA data centers, as well as for data producers, and also other topics like uh, the comprehensive data quality recommendations uh, for data producers and, uh, and the distributors. We also conducted um, the reuse readiness assessment for data quality software products and that work um, and also the technical note was led by uh, Bob Downs. And you can find detailed information to those um, technical notes and publications from the NASA ESO, uh, the Estes Standards Office website. Uh, you can find the link here. Um, so what's the next step for ECIP IQC? Uh, we welcome inputs and suggestions from the community. And we have some initial thoughts. For example, we want to seek experimentations with and the feedbacks from uh, for our IQC publications and the recommendations and make further improvements. And we also want to expand the scope that um, the IQC has been traditionally looked for. Um, that's the satellite-based remote sensing products to include other types of data 
uh, for example, from um, Airborne Institute and the citizen science. So to get help us to get there, to start the journey, uh, we organized the two sessions uh, at a winter meeting uh, this year. One was the session that David organized yesterday. And uh, the other one is the citizen science data and information quality session that we're having right now. Um, I think we have an amazing agenda for today's session and we invited uh, great speakers from different agencies and they will share their experience, uh, knowledge and thoughts on different aspects of data quality for citizen science research. So I consider this as kind of a kickoff for our journey uh, for ECPIQC to uh, um, move on to where we want to achieve. So um, given that, I want to welcome our first speaker today. Let me first launch our slides. So our first speaker for today is Helen Amos. Uh, she's a research scientist working for the GLOBE program at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. GLOBE, oh, sorry, this doesn't work. I guess we have to go to the PowerPoint. Oh, yeah. Sorry, give me a second. Can you help, Alex? Yeah. See, Sorry, there is a technical uh, issue here, but I want to continue my introduction to Helen. Uh, GLOBE is the largest and longest running citizen science program in the NASA Earth Science Division. And Helen leads outreach to the science community um, and is trying to increase the use of global data in research. And her presentation today is Citizen Science Data Quality, the pro uh, GLOBE program. Great. Do you wanna? Sure. Let's get away. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay in the back? Thumbs up if yes. Okay. Thank you, Yixing, for organizing this session and inviting me to participate. Um, so my name is Helen Amos. I put this together with Travis Sanderson, who is a long time, um, he's our chief data scientist and a long time um, participant with GLOBE um, and a key member of the team. So my background is as a earth science uh, research scientist, and I was brought onto the GLOBE team uh, a little more than a year ago to increase engagement with the research science community. And so my end goal being to see more scientists engaging with the GLOBE data set, I care a lot about the data quality. Um, and I use it in my own research, and so I think that's a testament to trusting the data quality and fitness for use. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what GLOBE is, how the data is collected, what procedures are currently in place for quality assurance, and then some more exploratory work that we've done recently with a couple of interns sort of probing new aspects of data quality that are coming up as um, the program evolves and does things like releasing an app, right? That was sort of a game changer for us in 2016 and has brought about new data quality issues. Um, so GLOBE stands for Global Learning and Observations to Benefit the Environment. Um, it is a large and long running international science and education program that gives people in the classroom and citizen scientists outside of the classroom a way to make earth observations and contribute those back to a global data set. Um, to give you a sense of the number of participants that we're working with and the scale of what we have to manage, um, so we are now in our 25th year of operation. We have 41,000 schools in the system, 200,000 citizen science account uh, user accounts with us, and those are spread across uh, 122 countries, and the State Department helps us manage those relationships with, with the countries. So it's a really diverse group. We have a lot of stakeholders, um, but it's a big group, which means power of the crowd, right? Um, GLOBE data is being used in research, and this is 
you know, I am here to support this and here to support the expansion of this. Um, one example is using um, our citizen scientists in our schools are collecting observations of clouds. And one really tricky thing for satellites to do is to separate snow on the ground from clouds. But that's a very easy thing for someone to do on the ground to tell what is a cloud and what is snow. And so that has been used to um, filter out cloud scenes from snow scenes in MODIS data. Um, on the left, this is one uh, that came out of a group in NASA Langley, uh, Dr. Brant Dodson. So everywhere you see a triangle, that is a volunteer participant using the Globe Observer app to record air temperature and cloud cover. And then this just got published in the Journal of Applied Meteorology and Climate, looking at the effect of uh, cloud cover and the temperature depression during the uh, 2017 solar eclipse. So the data is being used. Every time a new publication comes out, we learn more about the quality of the data and the fitness of use. Um, and as the data set is growing with the uptake of the app, um, I'm excited to see more and more of these kinds of papers coming out. So how big is our data set? So I said we have a lot of users. Um, we have a very large geographic reach, um, including, we don't have a pointer here, but I'll point out like Antarctica. There's also stuff in the Arctic. Um, so we are on all seven continents. Um, you know, we have people going across the interior of Australia, really wild locations. So GLOBE is reaching large geographic scales, large human scales, and enabling earth science collection in ways that were previously not tenable. Um, just to give you a sense of how quickly some of this data is accumulating. So the different colors are different kinds of data that can be collected. Um, the, the green diamonds, that's um, tree height. So you can use your smartphone in your pocket to measure the height of trees. It's pretty cool. You just tilt up, tilt down, walk to the tree. So now you have one angle, two angles, a side of the triangle. It's just trigonometry and you can get a tree height. So that launched in March and we're approaching 15,000 observations. And you can see the little green, right? Like it's accumulating very, very quickly. Who's collecting all of this data? So we really have two populations when we are thinking about both our engagement and our resources, but also curating the data set and the data quality. And we have teachers and students. Um, these are people who are known to us. We know their names, we know their school. Um, they're often doing in-person trainings. Um, and I think of this group as they're giving us depth. So once a a classroom is invested with GLOBE, they're making, like these are the folks who are going out and making repeat observations, you know, class period after class period, week after week, year after year. And our citizen scientists, those are the folks using the app, they're really giving us the broad geographic coverage. So you have something like when I showed the, the map of the solar eclipse data, right, you can get tens of thousands of observations across the geographic area at a single time. It's pretty amazing. So think sort of depth versus breadth. Um, how are people collecting? So this is starting to get into where quality assurance meets sort of constraining the environment that people can work in. So we have these two groups and they can pick the way that they are collecting and entering data. Um, our teachers and students have access to all of these modes of collection, whether it's an automated weather station, they're doing manual data collection, so think pen and paper, and then that's being recorded online, um, or the mobile app. Our citizen scientists are just using the app. Um, so you are a participant, you are picking your mode of collection, and then you can select the kind of data that you want to collect. Um, again, this is not sort of you get to do whatever you want, so GLOBE has spent an enormous amount of time creating very carefully crafted protocol. So these are step-by-step -step instructions that are going to tell you. So let's say you want to do salinity, or water, it's going to tell you what to do, how to do it, and which instrument to use. And so in terms of knowing the provenance of the data, anytime you see a salinity measurement in the GLOBE database, you're going to know what protocol they followed to collect the data and what sensor that they used. And so that's very, very important in terms of trusting the source and the method of the data. Um, anything that has a little iPhone icon has been sort of appified, so to speak. And so those are things that you can do 
in the, in the foam. So you pick your mode of collection. You pick the protocol that you're gonna follow. Um, the protocols are freely available, they're just PDFs, and you can go get them. But in order to contribute data to the database, we, um, we require training. So for a number of years in GLOBE, it was in-person training. Um, E-training e or online training has expanded access to GLOBE. Um, and if you're using the app, the training is inside the app. So anyone who is contributing data, they're doing it with known instruments, following known protocols, um, and having to pass training. So what sort of data um, do we need to quality control? So it's both qualitative and quantitative. So to give you a sense, so this is a record of temperature. Um, this is a classroom going out every day for an entire year, except for weekends, and measuring air temperature, which is pretty incredible. Um, so that's sort of discrete data. You know, you're getting a single number that you need to make sure is physical and not, you know, saying it's 400 degrees, um, but it's something physical. We're also getting photos. We have about a million photos to curate um, that come from the app alone. Um, so when people are telling us through the app that they see cumulus clouds or stratocumulus, we're also getting photos to back that up so that someone using this product for research could look at it and say, oh yes, I agree with that. Um, but these are both very different kinds of data that as we're ingesting them need to be qaqc so sort of our data quality assurance pipeline that is currently operational and in place now um, starts with these standardized protocols. So again, you pick your mode of data collection, then you're gonna pick the protocol that you wanna follow, where you do participant training before they can enter data in the database and contribute. Um, as the data is ingested, um, so Travis has worked really hard on this for a number of years, um, there are range and logic checks. So for example, if you're doing pen and paper data collection, you're taking your clipboard and then you're gonna go enter your data manually online. If you try to enter a future date, you're like, it's January 15th, 2020. You'll be prompted like, that's invalid, um, try again. So these range and logic checks, making sure that you're not trying to enter non-physical data. Um, and then photos, so photos actually come so photos coming in through the citizen science app come to an actual human on our team. Um, we're making sure there is nothing naughty in the photos, nothing proprietary in the photos, um, but also we don't want faces. So we're working with minors and students, and so we really do not want personally identifiable features. So it's okay if it's the back of a head, but we are human screening to make sure that those photos don't have um, faces. So that's what's operational. But as the uptake of the app has grown, it has necessitated sort of scrutinizing the data in new ways. And so I had a really awesome intern this summer that um, I shared with Eric Capotas. His name was Kanan Arija. Um, and he started to look at stuff that we knew was happening. And we were like, how feasible would it, how feasible would it be to catch these issues in an automated way and give user feedback? So one is blurry photos. So one thing you can do in the app is you can report when and where you see um, mosquitoes breeding, where they're laying eggs. And we want people to, if they can, get a sample of the water and use their phone with a clip on microscope to get a picture of it. So this is helpful, but this is too blurry. And we get a lot of blurry photos. So it is too blurry to see the morphological features, the anatomy of the mosquito to tell whether or not it's a mosquito that could potentially transmit disease or whether it's a, a non-carrier. And so this turns out to be, the trick is the threshold, but it's, it's a known issue. And so we're sort of working on, is there a way to do this in a more automated way? Um, another issue that we have is repeats. So I think anyone who has ever run a citizen science project knows that people, um, in order to get to the top of a leaderboard, right, if you're rewarding the top 10, doing like shout outs for top 10, people will try to hack the system just to get to top 10. Um, we saw evidence of this with the same photos just being, right, they're not unique photos, it's the same photo being submitted again and again and again and again. And so our interns 
um, doing exploratory algorithm research to figure out what is a fast and efficient way to do it. Right now, the efficiency is the problem. It's very, the algorithm we currently have, um, sort of that we came up with this summer is very slow, but it's a known issue. Um, and then another one, um, so this is actually something I'm personally doing is, if you are monitoring, so I'm interested in dust storms from a research perspective. We don't have a lot of dust data, and so when we have people reporting dust storms, it's really valuable, but sometimes they say they see a dust storm and they send us photos and we know we don't see dust. Um, so email intervention. Is it in your email intervention successful? So I'm running a six month pilot right now. When people send me dust data, I automatically get an email, then I go look at their photo, and if it's not a dust storm, I reach out to them. So Ask me in three months what the outcome is. I'm about three months into it. Um, sometimes I get feedback, sometimes I don't. It's very interesting, but I'm curious if email intervention will have an impact on our quality. So as the data set is growing, we are also hearing about new issues being discovered in the data set, um, which we perfectly expect, right? People are slicing and dicing and scrutinizing the data in ways that we didn't think about. And so another thing we did with um, an intern at Goddard this summer was take that feedback seriously and go start to flag the data for some of the issues. So um, the big one that you see is someone noted that they were seeing negative elevations. We're like, that's weird. And it actually it turns out to be um, a historic choice about the base map that GLOBE selected for elevation because when we originally envisioned GLOBE, it was schools on land and what's happening is that tourists on ship decks are using it to make cloud observations, which is a perfectly legitimate observation, but our topography map was reporting bathymetry and not positive elevation. So that was sort of an aha. Um, another one that isn't turned out to be a real issue was time. So time at 0000 UTC, that is an actual time. It is physical, but it turns out in that situation, it was one school that was sort of fudging the data for clouds to do something else. And so as an intervention, we've contacted that school. So the punchline here was the data set's growing, it's attracting more research. And so because of that, we're learning new ways that we need to be QA, QC the data. And this was sort of exploratory work, but it was very, very good. So it's sort of wrapping up, um, it's a big worldwide community um, and growing. Quality assurance and operation right now is multifaceted. Um, starting with training, standardized protocols, range and logic checks. Um, we make the data freely available to everyone, and I will put in a plug for um, if you are interested in sort of fundamentals of what the data is and how to access it, I run a virtual training, um, and the next one is coming up. There's the bit to register. So it's a one-hour training. Come learn how to grab our data. So that's it. Quick question, how do you um, make sure that participants have training if they're using an app? Um, so it's one of these, it, you, can't, you can't start collecting data until you get past it. So like if you were to download the app and say and make a land cover observation, the first thing, like you would create an account and the first thing that would pop up is training. Okay. And so you have to actually go through that training to get to the screen that says collect data. Excuse me, one second. Sure. You basically, well, you did your three ways. You said auto, automatic main, uh, stations, and mm -hmm. also mobile, and also even can use your own manual to ask to 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 measure it. So That's when right. you collect those data, do they specify what kind of way they're doing this? Yes. Uh, so and then do yeah. You, so when you get the data set, you could see whether or not someone is using the app or sure. a data logger or. Yeah. But do you then do you? After that, you analyze them separately. Perhaps okay, some group may be more accurate than the other, like data quality control or something. Um, so he's going to switch. So I currently don't separate them. Um, yeah, so I, I put them together. That's a good question. But you could do that. So and when you download the data, you can see it's sort of, we call it the source of the data, whether it's the app or whether it's um, a data logger. 
Uh, I just Thanks, had Helen. a quick question. Uh, it's a really Go nice ahead. presentation. Um, you have a human. The, the phrase this week is "human in the loop." So yeah. you you have humans in the loop to kind of try to maintain some level of quality. Do you see in the future any way of like automating that with I don't know machine learning techniques exactly. or yeah, it's not sustainable, right? Yeah, we have to. Um, I don't think cutting the human out of the loop is the way to answer, but um, so cutting the human out of the loop is not the answer entirely, but. Uh, for scale, we have to move to a machine learning. Yeah. Thanks, Alan. Um, our next speaker is uh, Laura Armland uh, from NOAA. And Laura has been with NOAA for 17 years. And she and John McLaughlin serve as NOAA's citizen science co coordinators. Together, they help manage NOAA's citizen science community of practices of over 200 people and work with over 50 citizen science programs and projects on topics ranging from weather and oceans. Thanks, Laura. Okay, go thanks. Ahead. I'm gonna start my timer to make sure I don't, don't go over time here. Okay, so thank you for having me here today. Um, as I said, I, I co help coordinate citizen... Oh, they're not showing up? Okay. Sorry, I don't think it might happen every time. So just when you have someone come in, turn off the user with this button, and then turn it back on. All right. Okay. So anyway, anyways, um, thank you for having me here today. Um, my name is Laura Ormland. I help coordinate citizen science over at NOAA. And today I, I thought I'd try to think of a clever title, but really this whole thing of the concept of the power of the crowd, can we trust it? And the best way I thought to tell the story was through some case studies at NOAA. Oops. All right, so before I go any further, I, th in order to tell the story, I really had to do a deep dive into some programs at NOAA. And I wanna give a shout out to my colleagues who really took some time to share some of their in-depth stories on data quality. In particular, Chris Bowser, Brian Korzynski, Matthew Men, Ken Knapp, Manoj Nair, Noah Newman, Lisa Natanson, and Katie Sweeney. It's their stories I'm gonna be trying to tell as best possible. So in terms of the talk today, I wanna to first provide you with an overview of NOAA Citizen Science go through these seven case studies, share some common themes that came across as I, as I learned about these programs in greater depth, provide some recommendations for data quality, and then allow some time for questions. But before I go any further, just by a show of hands, how many folks in here are practicing citizen scientists or running programs? And, and how many are just interested in learning more about citizen science and data quality? Okay, all right, great. Helps me know how to tell the story, thank you. So a little bit about NOAA Citizen Science. We have about 50, over 50 programs or projects that are listed in the citizenscience.gov catalog, which is sort of the federal hub for citizen science. We have an internal community of around 230, community of practice of 230 people, but our citizen science programs really run the gamut. They're cyclones, they're weather, they're fisheries, they're oceans, they're bathymetry. So we've got a wide range of programs that we really try to, you know, try to you know, harness at NOAA. And as I dug into these, as I, I go through the seven case studies, I realized they really broke out into two categories. One in which the identities of the participants were not known and four programs in which the participants were known. And I'm gonna tell the stories in that, in that way. So I'm gonna start with the unknown participants through three programs called Stellar Watch, Cyclone Center, and CrowdMag. First program, Stellar Watch, is uses the Zooniverse platform, which is an online platform to analyze various audiovisual types of uh, files. And the, part the hope was that the participants could help with photo identification of, uh, of research on stellar sea lions. There's an endangered population of stellar sea lions in the Aleutian Islands that has declined over 90% in the last 30 years. There are these, and the scientists have stationed these remote cameras which can produce, you know, they take pictures of the sea lions, but they can produce them for hundreds of thousands of images in a single year. So the hope was that the crowd could help reduce the number of images that scientists actually had to go through. Give you a sample of what it looked like. There are two workflows. One is simply binary. Is there a sea lion in this image? As you can see here, there is. And there's a three option workflow in which the participants are asked to actually look at the images and not just say, is there a sea lion there, 
but is there one with a, a tag or a number on it? Is it is there one with a number can you, and and it's readable? Is there one with a number and it's not readable? Or are there no C lines with tagged you know tagged IDs in there? So to give you a sense now, I'm, and this is the order I'm going to follow for each program. In terms of the data quality, I have to talk about it in terms of those workflows. The first thing is that they had a pilot group to test their responses. And that helped them improve their training materials as well as determine what the minimum number of images were that participants had to review. So in that case of that binary workflow, is there a C line in the image? They determined that only seven reviewers were needed per image or if five consecutive participants had the same answer, only five were needed. In terms of the three options workflow, they haven't really completed the analysis yet on what the minimum number of images is, but they currently go with 13. So the lessons learned that pilot group test approach is very helpful. It improves the training materials and can maximize your number of clicks. What's the minimum number of reviewers I need per image? Um, but yes, that binary workflow, just simply yes, no, is gonna get, get, get you the best possible data. As I mentioned, with the three options, once you go in from two to three, the analysis time increases substantially. And also, they're starting to shift towards a machine learning approach. So even though this, I also want to mention the project, this data has been very successful so far. There's been over 8,000 participants that have reviewed three over 300,000 images and saved hundreds of hours of time for a NOAA scientist. But they're still moving towards a machine learning approach. So it's not unreasonable to say, is citizen science, in fact, the best approach? Ask that question. So similar. Uh, Time check. Um, in terms of uh, using Zooniverse with Cyclone Center, in this in this program, participants answer questions about satellite imagery on of tropical cyclones, and the hope was that they could get a consistent record that they could that climatologists could use to identify whether cyclones were in fact changing over time or growing stronger. So, quick sample. I'm only going to go through one of these. They might be asked a question to choose the storm image, the image that appears strongest. I'm gonna skip the next one in the interest of time. And this one I found, you know, again, I was sort of learning as I went through this, and, I, and there were a lot of interesting stories in, to tell here in terms of the data quality. Again, they tried to figure out what was the minimum number of reviewers per image, and I'll get into that number difference in a second. And they also used what was called an expectation maximization algorithm, which is a way to basically uh, combine information from various people and also compare it to an expert identification, such as a meteorologist. But the lessons learned, I thought here, were pretty fascinating. And was the analysis early, maximize your clicks, don't waste them. Um, as they, they didn't know early on what the minimum number was, so they started with 30. But later found out that 10 was sufficient to reduce noise. It didn't really make a difference whether you, when you went below 10, it made a difference, but you know, 30 to 10 didn't. So they waste for a number of time, they wasted a lot of clicks. Um, the other interesting part of this is, you know, short-term goals. Don't underestimate the power of both short-term goals and simple questions. And I guess you sometimes learn sometimes when you make some mistakes as well. Their original goal was to classify every storm since 1980 and develop a consistent cyclone intensity record. But in the time it was taking them to do that, they got scooped. Uh, somebody else, another technique came into play called the automated Dvorak technique. Um, and basically, they were able to publish before the Cyclone Center technique came into play. So having smaller questions that you can answer in a more timely fashion while you're trying to answer the big picture questions is also something to keep in mind. And also, like the Stellar Watch one, machine learning started to replace the technique Cyclone Center was trying to fill. So again, ask yourself, is citizen science the best technique possible? Um, I'm going to skip ahead on some of the other lessons in here. And go to another one in which the unidentified participants wasn't through the Zooniverse platform, but a program or an app-based application called CrowdMag. So basically on your smartphone, you can download this application and your participants are able to take magnetic field me measurements via smartphones. And the hope is that the, the data they provide, it's expensive to collect geomagnetic data, but through these smartphone data points could fill gaps in the geomagnetic magnetic data coverage and improve models of Earth's magnetic field. So they went for data quality and numbers here. Their intent was to do a high volume data collection. So in one second, when somebody snaps, uses that app, they're gonna get 250 data points. And it, though it may be noisy, um, you know, they went, they went through the high volume aspect, but it's still noisy. So instead of using the average of those data points, they use the medium, the median number is a point they go forward. And then they do another test point 
where they compare that number to a, to a model, what the model says it should be. And taking into account a plus minus 10% range for radiation, if it falls within that range, the data point will go forward to the next set of tests. If not, it's gonna be excluded from the database. Um, and then they also perform a series of automated checks to further refine the data. So in terms of lessons learned, it's a numbers game. The higher number of data points you have, you, you stand to best improve your data quality. Um, they're still working whether or how it can contribute to models, but they did find that they can generate localized maps with greater resolution. And another interesting lesson was the community engagement aspect. They get two to three questions a week on this, which is an opportunity, sort of a teachable moment that I also heard sort of in the presentation before me, that teachable moment to educate the volunteers, help them learn about the project and the research at hand. So the next four programs are all have known participants that they can reach out to if there are questions in the data. Uh, the first one I'm gonna start with is Coco Raws, commonly known as Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. Do we have any Coco Raws observers in here? Is that a curiosity? Okay. Um, so in this program, participants measure and map precipitation at their home locations or schools. Um, and this data has been used in, in, you know, through many aspects at NOAA for use by the National Weather Service, emergency managers, hydrologists, and many others. Um, in terms of the data methods, and again, I had to take a couple notes here as I was learning along the way, um, so I'd like to have them in front of me. But in terms of the, the data quality aspects and the checks, they happened on that data entry phase and post data entry. Um, in terms of the range checks that would enter, I, I'm, a, I'm reminded of when I was trying to enter in something on a store last night and I couldn't get my credit card information. And just like that, if somebody tries to enter in, say, 35 inches of precipitation, which would exceed a world record, it's not going to let them do that on the front end. Next step, as it go after those, just the simple data entry checks, um, goes to a manual series of checks where local and regional coordinators will overlook the data. And I'm going to skip to the next slide. So here, the data, somebody puts it in the, the form, it ends it up and ends up on the map. So you can see with the gray points, which are basically no precipitation, if you suddenly see a red data point which says three inches, okay, you might wanna, you might wanna follow up with a volunteer on that one. And there's also gonna be an internal program that's gonna check how does that data point compare to the five closest stations, which can help if the five closest stations are nearby, but if it's 100 miles away, maybe a little bit less helpful. So going back, and then after those checks are conducted, NCEI will run a series of automated checks on the data. Um, if anything is, you know, looks questionable, they're going to generate a ticket, and the local coordinator is going to know to follow up with the volunteer. Um, and they also have extensive training materials. I've just watched their video, and it, it's impressive. So again, it's, they're trying to do it on the front end of the data collection and the back end once the data is collected. So the, in terms of the lessons learned here, what was interesting is that most of the errors they get are reporting. They're not measurement errors. It's a decimal wrong. It's a date wrong. It's not that somebody's measuring it wrong. They're just reporting it incorrectly. Um, the other thing that was interesting here is that volunteers really appreciate being contacted, even if it's about something that may be concerning. They're going, hey, my, my data is being used. <laughs> this is great. And again, the value in those teachable moments, every, almost every person who worked on these programs shared that same story. Um, expect mistakes, especially typos, and also to point out that automated checks can't catch everything. There's always going to be a need for some sort of data quality, both manual and automated. And the value of the metadata and the AI and the future of machine learning I'm going to talk about together because, again, as you try to find these extreme, you know, outlier points, if somebody in the notes said, hey, this is the most rain I've ever seen in my life, or wow, we haven't seen rain in 50 days, that information is going to be used to help ground truth the data. And it's also something that they hope in the future through machine learning processes can harness that information as another data quality um, approach. There, got it. Okay. Um, similar, we have a cooperative observer program that's been around for hundreds of years before NOAA became NOAA. Um, the participants measure daily air temperatures, precipitation, and again, this information is used extensively for climate records and weather forecasts and such. Um, in terms of the methods, you'll see some similarity in patterns to the COCO ROS program. They enter data through a program called Weather Coder, which is, which is going to be able to detect some, you know, extreme values at, on the front end. It's then going to go to the monthly closeout reviews, which is basically a monthly review by both the, the volunteer or observer and the weather forecast office. And what's interesting, the observers are trained in that whole closeout process to check for errors. 
Once that check is completed, NCEI will conduct their automated checks and anything that's you know, of concern is flagged, once again goes into some version of a ticketing system. In terms of lessons learned, the more extreme weather events we're seeing are making that ability to detect, to detect outliers a lot more difficult. So that's something that's gonna be an interesting challenge as they move forward. But let's not forget that for the last 100 years, this program has been supporting a lot of our weather products and, and models. I'm gonna wrap up in just a moment here. I have one, how long? One minute? Two minutes, okay. All right, so also kind of going back into my back, my, my wheelhouse, cooperative shark tagging program, which has been around since the 1960s. Participants, mostly fishermen, tag sharks um, in, the North, in the North Atlantic. And that information is vital for NOAA. It helps support our population assessments and our management measures. And again, you start to see similar things. Their first step in data quality is to follow up with the volunteers and rapidly. The sooner they follow up with them, the better. Pictures to validate the information. If somebody reports an Atlantic sharp nose shark is 20 feet long, that's immediately gonna set off alarms because they tend not to be bigger than four feet. Um, and again, they also have an automated database for various controls on the front end, the back end, looking at sizes, locations, even comparing the, the animal's fate to the tag. Um, and again, volunteers like being contacted. Again, they want to know the story of their shark. Um, and I'm going to breeze through this one, the Hudson River Eel Project, in which participants catch, count, and release American eels, a species in decline along the Hudson River. Um, what was unique about their methods in this project is the word simple reigns supreme here. Um, their nets that they use to catch the eels are, doesn't, can't catch anything larger than a pencil. Volunteers really only need to be able to count and make one, one species identification, um, and their trainings are extensive. And they also have what's called a quality assurance project plan, which lays out their methods and guides the activities of the program. But due to the program's simplicity, it enhances that data quality. There's just not many mistakes the volunteers can make. Um, and further, they emphasize to me the importance, again, of metadata, the value of that paper, those recordings, and ground truthing the information. So I'm going to wrap up the story in two simple slides here. What are the common themes we've seen? Simple, keep it simple. <laughs> keep it simple and you increase your chances of better data quality. Keep that metadata coming. It can help explain the information at hand. The combination of paired manual and automated checks can really catch things. Each one can catch errors in unique ways. And further, the, the overlap of machine learning and citizen science is really coming into play more and more, even in a talk I just saw. You know, for example, can the citizen science information help, you know, train the algorithm? And for what the algorithm can't pick up in that 1%, can the citizen scientists grab, you know, produce that information? And again, known versus unknown participants, there's unique lessons in each for the unknown participants. Pilot test, pilot test often, keep it simple. Ask yourself if citizen science is best, and, and it's a numbers game. More data is better data quality. For the known participants, don't underestimate the value of following up with your volunteers and that reporting errors are most common. So in my last slide here, I think the lessons learned on all of this are keep it simple, pilot test early and often, combine manual and automated checks. Automated checks just can't catch everything. Um, engage the volunteers with questions sooner rather than later and always ask yourself, is citizen science the best approach? And with that, um, thank you for your time. Hi, Laura. Um, for the Cocoa Rats, did you ever do an assessment on the value of those data? Did they fill in a, a temporal hole in a time series that couldn't have been gotten to in any other way? Because I think that's one of the things about there's there's two things: the quality of the citizen science data, and then the value of those data. When you say the value of those data, in terms of the scientific value. Oh, I believe they have some, and again, I, I'd be happy to follow up with you. I believe they have some publications, so if I can get your contact, I believe they have them. They they do it rigorously. You're about to get my contact information in a second. Just a real quick question regarding the manual checks of the data. What's the manpower utilized for that? It, it varies, and that's a great question. Um, in various cases, if I think about the Hudson Hill program, they have at least two full-time staff members. Um, in Cocoa Rods, I believe they have five to six, and at least two work on some of those manual checks. I think it varies by program. Even with the Cooperative Observer Program and NCEI, they do some manual checks there as well. But I think it varies by program. Thanks.
Thanks again, Laura. Our next speaker is Steve Dix. Steve is the technical director of the Hydrologic Data Group at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. He is a member of numerous international oceanographic data science teams and is the chair of the Southern Ocean Observing Systems Data Committee. In addition to his service on the technical advisory board for RDA, Steve was also ESIP's vice president in 2018. Thanks, Steve. Hi. Uh, yeah, my name is Steve Diggs. I'm at Scripps, and thanks for the invitation to speak in this uh, session. Um, so this is a little different perspective than what you guys have gotten so far. You've had programs and agencies that run community um, data or community science efforts, um, and they speak directly to how they assess the quality. Our cluster in ESIP, <clears throat> excuse me, just getting over cold, is um, is more of a clearinghouse of information, and 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 we snuck in a, a sneaky little title here. We really are talking about turning community um, science uh, or citizen science into community data and information and knowledge. Um, oh yes, okay. Here you go. So um, we're from the community data cluster. We started about a year ago, and uh, we want to connect communities to information and vice versa, and um, how we got started a year ago, um, I was at a meeting called uh, Data for Black Lives. And what came up was that Flint, uh, Michigan residents still don't have clean water. And you know that because people are still getting sick and the water looks rusty coming out of the faucets. But data are not being taken to mitigate that. Um, and so we know that we have an EPA and we have NOAA, we have all these agencies, and yet people who are turning on their faucet don't have access to that information and that knowledge. And ESA has a bunch of people that have that expertise. So we wanted to connect it together through the cluster. And then I tweeted out something that um, I thought was interesting, and it was people living in the first world under third world conditions. So, um, but we're gonna talk about the quality that comes out of these efforts. And this is people who are, uh, these are people who are collecting data nationally and internationally. And what does the quality of those data have to do and I asked Laura this, with the value of getting that knowledge back to people. So these are some of the topics we want to cover in the next 10 minutes or so. Um, what do we mean, mean, mean by citizen science in, in our clusters uh, definition? The quality and the access uh, and the obstacles associated with it and then the potential solutions and uh, turning those things into knowledge. So what do we mean by citizen science? Well, Zooniverse was one that was brought up earlier. If you don't, how many people here are familiar with Zooniverse? So you know about Galaxy Zoo and the stay-at-home mom that has a galaxy named after her because she has sharper eyes than everybody else that was looking at it. And it really is um, just an outsourcing labor problem. And you find people who would have been great astronomers who just never got the formal training and they start looking at it and they develop this expertise. And that quality tends to be pretty high because they're just doing this binary classification really fast and their own expertise snowballs as they do it more. So it's a volume question. There's the citizen science. I think Noah is very familiar with this of going back over the old maritime records, right? And then we do fill in that time series. So this has intrinsic value because these are measurements of Earth state that we never could have gotten. It happened one time, but there were eyes on the problem. And all we really need to do is entrain the citizens um, to participate in the science by doing transcription. Um, and so the er errors in this in these cases tend to be low as well because we have an expert who will go back in just like you were saying with three inches of rain and having a big red dot they see the outliers and then have a conversation with the person doing the transcription. The citizen science for um, um, in eBird something I'm not as familiar with but my co-chair Andrea Thomer is and basically they're doing classification as well in the ornithology or, um, community, the amateur ornithology. And there's the three basic steps, record your observation, share with the feral naturalist, and then discuss your findings. And so quality in terms of classification doesn't necessarily need to be high because you're not talking about either a sort of a trans transcription error um, of a number, you're really talking about is the species this or that. So uh, community-based science, what are we talking about? Um, working with the communities to build infrastructure. This infrastructure is really important because what we think of as data information really isn't a real thing when you get to people who need this information. For instance, <clears throat> this, there is this thing called the Clear Lab. 
And the Clear Lab is one of their primary things is they're looking at plastics in the in the food web. But what's really cool about it is, is that they've brought in their philosophy in life. And so they're calling them so anti-colonial, um, which is really interesting. So when they anti-colonial is sort of this, the way that you're looking at the hierarchy and how you judge people who want to be part of this program. And so when they're looking for undergraduates or postdocs, they're not looking at GPA, they're actually looking at the value of the person and how well they fit into the overall. They also are democratizing the kinds of things they do. So the instruments they put in the water, they make all of that stuff uh, public domain, which is really quite cool. Um, the community data archives, so um, back in Flint where the people don't have clean water, um, the community activists have set up their own repository for, and clearinghouse for information because if you go out and try to find out if there's clean water in Flint, beyond the EPA, there really isn't any place there. You can go to University of Michigan. So they decided to pull it all together in one place, which is how I found that there were no data uh, past 2017. Um, so it's sort of dropped out of the news. But it's great because it's, it's being community run and it's community accessible and it's talked about at the community level. A project I'm more familiar with is a former um, a professor of mine, Ramanathan, who came from this very rural Indi uh, Indian village. And there's this thing called ABC, Asian Brown Cloud, and it has to do with burning dung and wood fires um, in regions in Southern Asia and what that does to both air quality in terms of health and what it does uh, to incoming long wave radiation in ter terms of growing crops. And what he did was he um, got NSF to spring for some solar ovens. So people use solar to cook. But if you see this box on the back of the wall, that's actually recording the number of hours. So this, this woman here is cooking both with a traditional fire and with a solar cooker. What's cool about it is I met his daughter as a nine-year-old uh, third grade student. She grew up, got her PhD at UCLA, and now she started a company and together with her dad, they published a paper, not only over the improved air quality, which they used by putting up particle sensors and then having kids with cell phones actually text them the data, but they also were able to um, start using these boxes to give these families carbon credits, which they actually turn into money to buy more solar cookers. So it's pretty cool. Um, so the data quality um, issues for communities, I think that the first two speakers did a very good job uh, covering those types of things. And you know, for crowdsource transcription and classification projects, we have the accuracy, consistency, and trustworthiness. I think the trustworthiness is probably the hardest to control of all of these, but there are the strategies for mitigation are ones that our first two speakers uh, um, talked about. So iterative testing, volunteer training, replication across volunteers is super important, having two or more. We always say duplication is bad, but only in the case where it's unknown. When you have two people doing the same thing and they don't know about it, when they're working in concert with one another, you can use that to correct the data. And then having an expert review, somebody who's actually in the domain scientific field reviewing. And what you're doing is you're taking it in a funnel sense and bringing it down so that the workload on an expert to do quality control is actually manageable. Um, uh, the data, oh, it looks different. The data quality issues in citizen science, um, so the bias of completeness and georeferences, I think um, you brought up something where there was a historical elevation that was wrong and people were recording negative things. So knowing these things a priori is a way to get rid of the um, quality problems in citizen collected data. And then the coarseness of the identification taxonomic rank is not that big. Um, so we're looking, we're not looking at, you know, numbers behind the decimal point, but rather what species is this versus one another. And uh, potentially um, there are ways of, of uh, correcting for this. And I think Andrea was, would, would have been a much better person to talk about this than me, but there is a preprint paper that deals with this directly. Okay. So um, issues in the, obviously issues in community data projects. So for like the Flint project and Surya, um, and things that are coming out of the Clear Lab, the issues aren't those traditionally associated with data quality, but rather of uh, community participation and community relationships, which is really where our cluster lives, which is engaging the data. But of course, underlying that is that we want to have the quality of the information, the quality of the data, something that is viable to turn into knowledge. 
I've always often said that people in Flint don't necessarily want the data. They don't want tabular numbers. They want knowledge that they can use actionably at an activist level to go in and lobby um, their community leaders and politicians. Um, so to what extent are these communities able to access the data? These, there's a different dimension that we've been talking about in terms of data quality, and it's the data that you will use. Um, I work with postdocs and graduate students every day who are assessing data quality that's been taken by experts, but of course, if they can't access, and we always talk about fair data, if they can't get to the data, and if they can't understand the data, then the data quality becomes a second issue because the data utility or the, or the way that the ease of use becomes the primary thing. So we have these two things that we're using. One assume, assumes that you can use the data and the other assumes that the data are actually viable, true and good. So how do we ensure that the citizen science be, um, data becomes community data? Um, participatory action research, I mean, fully engaging people. So I think that it was Laura who said that uh, volunteers really appreciate an email, a phone call, and letting um, the quote unquote experts know that they are fully engaged. That's absolutely right. Um, we found that when we're looking across citizen science and citizen knowledge projects, that tends to come up as the issue that's most important. Um, the other thing is a community peer review. So just because people don't have PhDs in atmospheric uh, sciences, meteorology, oceanography, uh, geology, doesn't mean that they can't conduct really good peer review. Managing that tends to be very heterogeneous depending on the type of community science and community data project, but as a component, it, it tends to be critical. Um, community is a service. So uh, one of the things we're looking at as, a, as our cluster is not only um, having this peer review by and training people, but also bringing in the younger people through STEM education to, to home grow our own experts so that they already have skin in the game and they can become these community um, as a service members. And then they tend to, and I, I know this is true for all the scientists in the room, if it's yours, you want to ensure quality. If the people don't own the data, then they're, they're, they're less likely to ensure quality. Um, and then work with, of course, with the community archives themselves like Open Data Flint and making sure that not only are the data that are in there, but there's another aspect of quality, which is data age, right? So we take a certain set of data and then there's usually a quality control data set or an additional data set that uh, is meant to go in place of those data themselves. Um, but there's a lot more work here. And then that's great, great because we have a cluster as well. So again, just to reinforce the idea, um, we're not after data so much. We're not actually act after information, but in, in a community data sense, we're actually after usable knowledge for these communities. And we invite you to join us. Our next call is coming up February 12th um, at uh, 4 p.m. Eastern. And then that's our webpage for the cluster. And with that, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, so with the community data collection, uh, we get the data sets and then we analyze the data set, um, maybe we publish it, but uh, have you worked with the like local government or policy makers? Uh, to improve the, for example, livelihood of the people that are actually collecting the data sets? Like. Um, we're just starting to do that. So that's not where our expertise actually lies. It's actually coordinating between programs and not the specifics of the data collection methods themselves are working um, specifically. We have a big enough problem getting data that are actually either haven't been taken or need to be taken into the hands of the people who need them. So that's kind of more where we live. Thank you very good. Uh, I just wonder, can you be more specific to define your community here? So it seems to me, just like when you, a bunch of people, the scientists around, the citizen scientists, they do the bird watching. Yes. And just try to get all the data for this bird watching community, or because you also mentioned, you also want to get the, enough the experts in this kind of field, right? To do, to, to validate your data. So I really would like to know what do you mean by this community, community data set, right? Just okay, 
so the community, I mean, I can do this really quickly. There's, you know, basically three different communities we were talking about in the example. One were the Flint people who don't have any data at all. They don't know, they don't really know what the e, the initial EPA stands for. They don't, they expect it. They would go to something local on their page and find out something about their water quality. With the naturalist, of course, these are people who have a lot more expertise and they have, um, what the volunteers have is local expertise and local access, right? And so that community, um, the dearth of information or the, the lack of information is because there's nobody locally on the ground with the expertise actually watching these birds' eyes on. So there, then there's that community. And then, of course, there's the clear community with the ocean plastics, and that's more of a global community, just like Syria, where there's international concerns and we're having people both collect the data, um, curate the data, and they get it back into sort of an expert loop, be it atmospheric scientists for the Asian brown cloud or oceanographers for the um, uh, plastics in the ocean and food web. Yeah, that's what I said before. How do you draw the line? So up in what, what scope of the community can you can define us? We haven't, going from the bottom up of no knowledge, we haven't found a ceiling yet, and I'll let you know when we get there, of when we meet the line where there's suddenly too, there's enough information that we can quit. So we're usually talking about the data haves and the have-nots, and those are three, three or uh, three up to N uh, different communities. I actually have a question for you, Steve. Uh, okay. <laughs> So I think your thoughts on the um, <clears throat> community peer review yeah. is very interesting. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how to capture and consolidate the community opinions on some data products. And this can go beyond citizen science data. Yes. For example, the data products that go into the NASA uh, right. DAX for archive, and how we capture that information from the user community. That's a real social engineering problem, and we're just like I said, we're just getting into that. Um, with the EPA, uh, we've seen a real interest in. Uh, I have a friend at the EPA who actually wants to work side by side with the people gathering community data. So their University of Michigan had, and I think they will start again, issuing kits back to people to do their own water quality testing, right? And I think what would be what is really cool, and we just haven't had the, enough resources to do this yet. The plan is to have um, webinars where people are actually doing community peer review together over the internet. So people at their faucet and the experts at the EPA. And there's interest in both sides. It's it's what's interesting to me is that we're finding scientists in the least likely places we expected to find them. People have assigned both, like the Zooniverse with the Galaxy Zoo. There are people who there are astronomers who just have never seen the education, but have both expertise and interest and the quantitative brain to make the difference. So, um, you know, we can use use the um, web for uh, peer review, and we don't have to follow the traditional academic way of doing peer review. We have the web and uh, WebEx and other things. Thanks. Huh? Thanks, Steve. And give me one second. <laughs> So our last speaker for today is Anne Bowser uh, from uh, Wilson Center. Dr. Anne is the Director of Innovation with Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. She is interested in how new advances in science and technology can support and align with democratic values, including through citizen science. And leads the Wilson Center's participation in the Earth Challenge 2020. So, welcome and talking about the amazing Earth Challenge 2020 project. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for organizing the session. It was really wonderfully curated, and thanks to the other speakers who did the hard work of introducing citizen science so I don't have to. But I'll give, a, how do I make this work? Like that? Yay, okay. I'll give a little bit of perspective anyway. My disciplinary background is human-computer interaction, so I learned about citizen science from the big data angle. 
Right now, 2019, there are 1.5 million people who contribute to citizen science on World Water Monitoring Day. That's one day. There are thousands of projects on all seven continents, as well as work done through projects like Galaxy Zoo that allow people to study outer space. And according to one paper published by the University of Washington, the economic valuation of citizen science is up to 2.5 billion in in-kind support for biodiversity monitoring alone. So there's a lot happening right now. There's been a lot happening over the last 100 years, but ICT uh, and the way that science is done and supported through the National Science Foundation, which is increasingly mandating public outreach components, other granting agencies internationally are doing the same is really pushing citizen science forward at scales that we've never seen before. This is all good news, but a lot of the work that's happening is still unfolding in silos. People aren't always collaborating, even people who are working in similar research areas, and they're not always sharing data. And because of this, there are data that are being collected and used to understand and solve local problems that could also be aggregated and reused in national or global monitoring assessments, and this isn't necessarily happening. So the last academic thing that I did, I don't get to do a lot of academic things anymore, was a paper that took me three years to write. This was in collaboration with RDA, CODATA, and WDS, which sponsored a task group on the state of the data in citizen science. And we just submitted a paper that's called Still in Need of Norms that had a couple key features. Uh, this was an exploratory study with 36 citizen science projects, largely survey and interview based that interrogated what's actually happening on the ground in terms of data collection, in terms of data quality assurance and quality control, and then other data management practices. By and large, we found that people were doing a great job with data quality. Every single project that we talked to used at least one QAQC method. 34 used, uh, 34, which is 92%, used more than one method, and 22, 61% used five methods or more. Where we didn't see so many strengths was in terms of data management, um, including archiving, but then especially documentation. So all of this awesome work that was being done in data quality wasn't always documented in a quality assurance or quality control plan, let alone at the point of access for the data if there was one. Because this is the data quality session, a quick overview of the taxonomy that we looked at for data quality. We explored human aspects such as targeted recruitment, volunteer training and assessment, instrument control, standardized instrument, whether it's a hardware sensor or a mobile application, calibration, um, the use of standards and data collection, which I'll talk about in depth later on, different verification mechanisms, as we heard from the presenters earlier, and then also documentation, which once again was the weak link. So with this academic experience in mind, I was recruited to join an existing coalition of Earth Day Network and the State Department around an initiative that was at that point in time unnamed. And Earth Day Network and State Department, who had been long-term partners around greening diplomacy, uh, use of U.S. embassies and consulates for science diplomacy with GLOBE and other partners, looked at the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, which is coming up, it's April 22nd, 2020, as an opportunity to use citizen science to help modernize the environmental movement, make it more rigorous, and make it more participatory by launching what came to be known as Earth Challenge 2020, as the world's largest coordinated citizen science campaign to date. Of the three main institutions, Earth Day Network is responsible for education and outreach. They do a fantastic job. State Department is the tech lead, and then we at the Wilson Center are responsible for making sure that this has value to the research community and also working with state on aspects related to data integrity. So the project has two primary goals. The first one, which is what Earth Day Network is really interested in, is equipping and empowering people around the world to understand and act on data to build safer and healthier communities. So in order to achieve this goal, we're building a new mobile application with different opportunities for data collection that lets people go out and monitor their environment, but is also pushing back information to the citizen science volunteer on opportunities for local policy interventions. 
So one of our research areas is plastics pollution. And we'll be able to not only encourage people to collect data on what is the actual problem, is it straws, is it bottle caps, but also share information on local laws or proposed bans or things like that to actually make a difference in addition to providing information on individual behaviors, recycle, things like that. Goal two, the one that I'm personally more interested in, is increasing the amount of open and interoperable citizen science data to help answer more complex and global questions. We're using the app for this, but we're also integrating data from existing citizen science initiatives. When this hit my desk, uh, Earth Day Network and State wanted to collect any piece of information related to environmental or human health, and my first job was narrowing it down. So we launched a call for people to tell us the most critical questions in environmental and human health. We got responses from all seven continents, including a research station in Antarctica. And we distilled these into six research questions. What is in my drinking water? How does air quality vary locally? Is my food supply sustainable? How are insect populations changing? What is the extent of plastics pollution? And what are the local impacts of climate change? And we've committed to exploring all six of these research areas through April 2020. But as the term infrastructure was discussed earlier, really what we're doing is developing a suite of technologies that can be reused to probe these research areas, but then also others. And we're making them open and available to scientists and members of the public for the foreseeable future. So going back to goal one, which we are addressing through a mobile application. In terms of data quality, this is the easy lift because we're building the app and it's entirely in our control. So one of the things that we learned during this process is that we're essentially running a big data citizen science project. We're not working with community members directly, so we lose opportunities to do things like targeted recruitment because the nature of our project is that we want to use this app to reach as many people as possible in a relatively short time frame. So we're looking at relatively simple volunteer training. It's what Globe mentioned as well, just clicking through some basic instructions on the mobile app. We're controlling the instrument through standardization, building a lot of automated data quality checks in, and then also calibration. So for the air quality research question, for example, a volunteer will take a picture of a white piece of paper so that the, the sensors within the phones, and this is the State Department's expertise, not mine, will be able to use that photo as a reference point for the second picture a volunteer will be asked to take, which would be of the horizon. Uh, data collection, again, standards come in later on. We consider pictures vouchers. So we're asking volunteers to take different types of pictures, and then we're also building redundancy into the project so that those will be persistent records that we can go back and verify later on. So if somebody says, I saw a plastics water bottle, there is hopefully a uh, picture of a plastics water bottle to back it up. In terms of review, we are partnering with a group uh, called YASA, which is a, another quasi-government institution. This one is based in Vienna, and they have a mobile application called PicturePile. So our app is for observational data collection, primarily through photographs, and PicturePile is the crowdsourcing application. So for example, one campaign they ran was around analyzing Earth imagery. Do you see deforestation over time? Swipe uh, left for no, swipe right for yes. These are the sorts of solutions that YASA is designing for us. And this gets malicious data out. It gets playfully malicious data out. Earth Day Network has some experience with trolling. And then it also allows us to label the data. So if we're collecting a picture of a plastics water bottle, you can actually have somebody say that's a plastics water bottle. Earth Day Network would love to have us say um, that's a Coke bottle. We're not sure if we're willing to take that step or not, but it's possible. And it's especially possible for other people to do this because everything that we're doing is open and available for public consumption. Um, the whole point of labeling the data is to hit that AI sweet spot that people have been talking about all session. We're lucky that our partners in the State Department are currently setting up the Center for Analytics. So we actually are going to have access to data scientists either through the State Department or through a partner like Microsoft, thanks to Jedi, that will be able to come in and actually do some of that machine learning on the images that we're um, collecting. And then we're trying to document everything, including a QA QC plan and through other mechanisms, which I'll talk about later. So goal two, the hard part. 
we're taking an approach where we're starting with data standards. And I realize that most of the talk is about data standards just because it's the current headache that I'm dealing with and I have to resolve by mid-March. Uh, new database, API platform, GIS, Geographic Information Systems Analysis, and then documentation through a new data journal. And then also most recently, a data catalog. And all of this is being done to increase the amount of open and really it should be fair citizen science data to help bridge that local to global nexus so that information can be used in local communities, but then also reused over time to help fill data gaps. The State Department would kill me if they saw the slide, but this is my interpretation of the information architecture. So everything on the bottom is what we're doing. Everything on the top is how we hope to work with partners. So I mentioned the mobile app that we're building, the connection to PicturePile. This is going to a database that will be procured probably through Microsoft, potentially through Amazon, and we'll be managing it for the foreseeable future. We're also working with partners. Some of them are already working with databases. This is ideal. Uh, best case scenario is we have partner citizen science projects who already have APIs, already have open data that's well documented. We know so far from the deep dive that we've done in plastics that this isn't always the case. And in fact, it's not necessarily the norm. So we're also going to, for the six research areas, make our database available to people who would like that service. Uh, we're building an API integration platform, which is the lightning bolt in the center. This is where the magic happens. It's kind of the keystone to the project. And then we're integrating and visualizing the data through GIS for each of the six research areas. This is analysis. This is harmonizing different data sets to create those global data products. And it's also our way of giving back the data to the communities because we know that maps are a way that people can access and understand information. They're a really powerful analysis tool as well as a communication platform. And then we're hoping that different partners within the research community and citizen science volunteers will find the data through the API platform or through the maps, depending on their preferred method and also reuse it. Standards, how many of you work in standards or have worked with the Open Geospatial Consortium? That's awesome. Okay, well, OGC is a really good partner here. They have a mantra called working code. So we're starting our approach to designing citizen science standards because no standards exist on the data front or the metadata front, or too many standards exist. It's kind of, you know, two sides of the same coin. By integrating data from plastics because that was the messiest data that we could find. So we've actually successfully integrated data from three citizen science projects who are monitoring macro pollution on beaches, one sponsored by NOAA, one sponsored by the European Environmental Agency, and one sponsored by an NGO. We're going to reality check this with uh, air quality data and insects data. Air quality is the simplest from a data modeling perspective. Insects data is already pretty standardized thanks to GBIF. And then we're going to store this in our new database, expose it through an OGC compliant API, and say, OGC, please tell us what we have done wrong and help us figure out how to uh, do a better job with your um, sensor things API so that we can then replicate it for the other three research areas and hopefully create a common core of interoperable information. Really quickly, our goal is to have the common core, which would be the Earth Challenge 2020 common core with different extensions, one extension for research areas, and then projects that are doing work in this research areas could also publish uh, additional extensions of their own. And once we have this, we can sort of tackle all of the other research areas and then hopefully create a platform so that people can do truly interdisciplinary work by using the standards-based approach and the common core to um, harmonize d data from the different disciplines that we're understanding. If anyone's interested in learning more, I'd love to talk about this after because we need a lot of help here. And then we hope to document it. So this is the last thing that I'm going to focus on since I know I'm running out of time. We have a really good partnership with Frontiers. Frontiers is a leader in the open science community. They are the biggest open access publisher in terms of volume, and they are collaborating with us on a data journal. This is a project that the Wilson Center is doing with the European Commission Joint Research Center. This is allowing people to talk about their data and their methods in a scholarly venue by submitting information the way you would submit information in a journal article, submit a formal quality assurance and quality control plan. And then we're bringing in peer reviewers, including people with knowledge of data and information, disciplinary experts, and citizen science experts. 
Once reviewers vet a data set or a method, it gets published and it also gets assigned a DOI to encourage other people to cite this and the results of the peer review process are published as well. This is our first attempt at documenting data quality and information quality by collecting qualitative information, really long QA, QC plans. And our hope is that over time, we can standardize this into more quantitative metrics. Is this fit for use in regulation according to this code? Is this fit for use in academic research? Is this fit for a different purpose such as education? My job was to build a data catalog. I built a data journal instead. So as of last week, our partners at Esri and the State Department are also committed to building a more traditional data catalog, which will take select information from the data journal and then also facilitate access by including information about the APIs. So this slide is just saying that I would love assistance on any of the projects. Um, Earth Challenge 2020 is very collaborative. It's run on a lot of in-kind support. It's a passion project, so we really do want any contributions that align with the general goals. And here is my contact information in case you're interested in learning more. Um, I just wanted to expand a little more on the data journal. So is there a new data journal being created just for this Earth 2020 effort? I, I wanted to understand better. No, it's for all citizens. So the awesome thing that's happening with Earth Challenge 2020 is people will start something because of this milestone that they want to have lasting value. So Frontiers sees value in this in part because they want to do something in citizen science that complements the work people are doing in disciplinary journals and the citizen science theory and practice journal. And they also, as a publisher, want to explore what it's like to publish data sets and methods instead of traditional peer-reviewed articles. So they see this as a pilot project that they're going to continue to invest in because it contributes to their business model and helps them explore a new area, but is also a contribution that they think they can make to support citizen science. So we're doing the initial push for data sets in the six priority areas, but then after April, we're going to open it up to all citizen science and all social citizen science data. Yeah. Um, early in your presentation, you um, were highlighting something that I found very, very interesting since I work with it every day, and that is that there was a lack of um, complete data management for the citizen science data. Mm -hmm. And you know, I might have missed it, but did you have a solution or a plan to mitigate that? Because it's really hard even in the professional science realm to bring everybody up to speed on good data management uh, practices and have that implemented. And so I wanted to have a discussion with you a little bit about how you handle that with citizen science data. Yep, so this is actually an argument that I get in with a lot of our partners because even you know the if you have a citizen science project, there's this joke that it's like a professional researcher, half an educator, and that's it. So all these people don't have the knowledge that tech partners would expect or really strong data and information people when it comes to data management practices. So there's this huge knowledge gap to bridge. We have a three-pronged approach. We're using Earth Challenge to demonstrate the value of good data management practices, especially APIs. We're developing some resources, like um, the API partner that we work with will really develop some good documentation that we'll review by different community members. And then we're also working with the Citizen Science Association's Data and Metadata Working Group to translate all of the work on that level to more of a citizen science practitioner audience. But it's a huge challenge. And we're also hoping to identify new partners with data expertise and archiving centers to join the team. Three speakers here, so we know that okay, citizen scientist data is actually all over, mm -hmm. and even since very early on. So my question is that: Do you think it's also the time for us even to issue DOI for those data, even though okay, they're even well, even regular data still have a quality quality problem? Yeah, because for instance, like myself, I'm a data producer. I know that my my data has many weakness there. So I just wonder: Is that the time for us? Because we're talking about citizen science, but not not many people knows about those data, and how do they access what to those data? Probably okay. They are they are not they cannot use it now to do some really okay solid science. I, I probably I even should not say that. Okay, but 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 my question is that: Do you think is the time we need to consider okay? 
to even assign the DOI for some data science, uh, citizen science data. So I think the DOI in itself is valuable. It's actually something that a lot of the projects we work with are asking for. A lot of people in academic institutions that do citizen science are uh, younger, may not be tenured, and they're looking for alt metrics or different ways to cite, which is a traditional metric, some of the work that they're doing. And DOIs in citizen science is demonstrating alignment with open science values and is also something that you can take to your tenure community and say, here is an impact of making this information resource available for reuse, and people are also actually using it. It also legitimizes citizen science data to certain communities in certain ways, especially because that's going to be backed with a peer review process. That's sort of the logic model behind um, the data journal. Thanks, thanks, Anne. So I want to thank again for our uh, four great speakers. And there are a few minutes left. Uh, we don't have too much time for discussion, but I want to open a question um, before we end this session. Um, so ECIP IQC is a platform, is to provide service. Um, and ideally, we can provide a platform to encourage um, collaboration and knowledge sharing um, across community members. And it's um, the community, you who actually do and conduct citizen science research know and hold the expertise um, on the uh, data quality related issues for citizen science research. And you know the needs and you know exactly the challenges where they are located in. And uh, we hope we can bring um, you a platform so we can come to share experiences and identify some um, um, topics that we wa want to work on and focus on together. So um, to end this session, I want to open uh, this question. And for ours, uh, the IQC cluster, it's really, we want to identify the topics that we can work on together. I mean, there are so many needs um, and challenges existing. And what are the near-term and long-term topics that we can, we can work on that has the most community needs and requirements, and also hopefully identify some low-hanging fruits that we can focus on um, in our full-on discussion in the future. Um, so I don't think we have much time left, two minutes. Any thoughts? <laughs> Helen? Um, I want to put the DOI issue actually up for community discussion. So um, Lisa, Lisa's nodding her head. So I walked into my job about a year ago and my first task I was given was get a DOI for the GLOBE data set. Um, it, it, it has not happened. We are at a sort of standstill. I need an answer from my agency about where, so which archiving institution could issue the DOI if we go that route. Um, do you get a DOI for the live data set? Do you just get a DOI for discrete like subsets of the data that have been post-processed and had value added to them with researchers by like matching them to the satellite? There's, um, there are big, questions to be answered about how to actually procure a DOI for your data set that um, sort of the agencies like putting their heads together is with the community would be a helpful conversation for ESIP to facilitate. And also probably the credits and uh, um, acknowledgements um, associated with the DOI and the data products. Any other um, comments, inputs? Exactly. What exactly the maturity of, of the citizen science data now? See, because that's exactly my question. Are, are they mature enough to be actually officially distributed? And even people can cite them like regularly. So that's my question. Because as a scientist, I, can, I consider citizen science data definitely has a certain role to help the traditional data. When like you compare the citizen science data with your model, I'm from no one. I would I would think simply consider this even can put you two way direction. You can help each other. 
not only body data citizen, but at the same time, citizen science data also can validate the model data. Yeah, even can help the prediction of the weather, right? So it's, yeah, so that's that's it. So what the state is now, where people, I, actually, I've I learned a lot. I even didn't know that the citizen science already started in 1960, or even, even earlier, because it's become more, more, more popular in recent years. People are starting talking to that, and also in AGU, the meetings, right? So I think let's discuss how, how mature and are we confident to say, well, this data actually is not too bad, right? So that, that's it. Maybe right? some indicators exactly. that we can use, very simple indicators to um, show the maturity and trust. Yes, yes. Even. That's also yeah. what I asked earlier. When you collect data from different ways, probably you, you want to do the metrics on that. Which, which data set probably, which, which way to measure data will give you a higher quality, more trustworthy. So that's, that's yeah. Many things we deserve to say. Deb? <laughs> um, on the DOI question, I just want to bring up that actually that's a broader problem than just citizen science. I mean, I've got projects where I've got thousands of people, scientists, contributing data and figuring out how to do the DOIs. I mean, I've got a particular method. I'm happy to talk to you about how I'm doing it. But it's not a well understood, decided thing as to exactly how you do it. Thanks. And just to go back for a moment about the question about the maturity of the data and the, the curation of the data, how, how you know, how, how well can you trust it, if that's how you want to think about it. Um, at, at NCEI, we've had an, an effort to develop a data stewardship maturity index and a model for that. There are some papers out there that uh, we've, we've put out and discussed at AGU that gives sort of some, some characteristics of, well, has, you know, how has the data set been treated and, and dealt with and documented and is it archived here or there or wherever. So there's a there's a whole model for doing some of that assessment. And so you know, that's one of the things out there to help us kind of sift through some of that uncertainty, I think. Um, another thing that we are starting to see are sort of independent uh, citizen science activities. So you know, these discussions have been really interesting and very informative. But they're all sort of a top-down kind of thing of data that somebody has and we're asking citizen scientists to review or collect through an app or do whatever. What we're starting to see now are uh, people who come up with some instrument package and put it on their drone and fly it around and then say, here's my data set. Or, Here's a float, and I've designed a way to send it out into the Gulf Stream and measure temperature. What do, what do I do with that kind of data? And so, you know, we're starting to see a different, more uh, individualized kinds of citizen science efforts. And that's going to be, you know, I, I don't know, maybe that's just a flash in the pan or something, or it's the beginning of a trend of, hey, uh, these, these new tools and platforms are easier and cheaper to come by. What are we going to start seeing that is going to influence how we think about what is citizen science completely? Thanks. Um, I don't want to hold you too long. I think we had an amazing session. And thanks again for our speakers and everyone joining our session today. And just want to let you know we have another session right after this one, I think in the same room. Um, about citizen science, so we can continue the discussion. Thanks. <laughs>